This morning, I have the pleasure to introduce to you Professor Jay Turner of the Environmental Studies Program. This fall, Professor Turner began his 10th year teaching at Wellesley. In this time, he has taught a wide range of courses covering topics such as environmental history, climate change, food systems and sustainability, and U.S. environmental politics. He earned a Master of Arts in American Civilization from Brown University and a PhD in the History of Science from Princeton. His first book, The Promise of Wilderness, chronicles the expansion of the federal wilderness system and public land reform. His current research focuses on the environmental history of batteries, reframing the social and environmental costs of the modern consumer economy. Professor Turner acted as the chair of the Campus Environmental Sustainability Advisory Committee during its inception and the creation of the Campus Sustainability Plan, which was adopted by the college last spring. Most recently, his, he has continued his work in sustainability through a highly successful year-long volunteer solar campaign in Natick, the largest of 51 solar campaigns sponsored by the state of Massachusetts. His dedication to sustainability at Wellesley and our neighboring communities speaks to his commitment and passion for environmentalism. Please join me in welcoming Professor Jay Turner. Good morning. Thank you, Amanda. Last time I saw Amanda, I think before today, was when I was headed out on vacation. It's like last August, and I was in the middle of upstate New York on Interstate 90, and I was like trying to herd my children into the line to get snacks, you know, while we were traveling, and it was all a little bit discombobulated, and I was kind of that harried father with, you know, all these kids, and I turned around, and there was Amanda <laughs> in line behind me, and since then, you've traveled the world and sailed across the ocean, so thanks for the introduction. Welcome back. It's really nice to be here and to see all of the Albright Fellows for 2017. Albright is just one of the real highlights of Wellesley, and it's exciting to be here. This is my first Albright talk. Considering the topic of my talk, um, this is a tough topic for me to talk about because there's a lot at stake right now with the Trump administration and climate change. And I had a couple of questions up here as a pre-quiz. I'm not sure if you all had a chance to look at those, but um, before I jump right in this morning, I'll just give you a second to read through and think about which of these tweets are Trump's. Okay, so hopefully that's enough time just to um, get a sense for the content of these four different tweets. So we do know that there are a number of statements that Trump has made that are cause for concern about climate. Things like the concept of global warming was created by and for the Chinese in order to make U.S. manufacturing non-competitive. This one's probably his most famous tweet statement on the issue. Uh, less well known, uh, record setting cold and snow, ice caps massive, the only global, global warming we should fear is that caused by nuclear weapons, incompetent pals. Now a generous reading of these tweets might suggest that you know, he's has a genuine concern about the position of the U.S. in the world and its ability to conduct trade. And here the issue is climate change, but it's also what our priorities are. Perhaps there are more urgent issues that we need to be thinking about and addressing before climate. But most people have read these as a statement that you know, he is not prioritizing climate. He doesn't believe the science and is committed to an agenda of rolling back policies that support climate change. And if these are the statements, certainly his initial actions in terms of assembling a cabinet confirm that he's going to be antagonistic um, to climate initiatives. So Scott Pruitt, the EPA administrator that he has nominated, is the Attorney General of Oklahoma and has really made a centerpiece of his work in the state of Oklahoma challenging the rules and regulations that the EPA has put forward over the last four or six years. Rick Perry is a stated climate denier um, who's former governor of Texas and is now appointed as Secretary of Energy. Both of these nominees are openly hostile to climate as an issue. Um, Ryan Zinke and Rex Tillerson have slightly more complicated positions on the issue of climate change itself, but both are very strong supporters of the fossil fuel industries. Zinke, as Secretary of the Interior, will oversee where oil and gas development takes place on the public lands. He'll have oversight of that. And Rex Tillerson, of course, is former CEO of ExxonMobil, who will be Secretary of State and a strong proponent of fossil fuel development. So these actions are good reason to be concerned. Now, 
back to this question. Any guesses about which of these may be Trump's? It turns out that this is a totally misleading question. None of them are actually Trump's. None of them are actually tweets. These are all statements by former Republican presidents because this is certainly not the first time we've seen an administration, a Republican administration, roll into Washington, D.C. with the stated goal of rolling back our commitment to environmental protections. Ronald Reagan made this a centerpiece of his campaign. It was uh, an issue that George H.W. Bush uh, took issue with, but in more complicated ways. And Bush had significant environmental achievements as well. But George W. Bush's administration was very hostile to environmental protection as well. So this isn't the first time we have seen this happen. And you know, when you look back at history, one of the lessons history offers, offers us is that it turns out to be a lot harder to roll back to, you know, to roll back environmental policy in practice as opposed to campaigning for it um, during election season. So today, to get at the state of the climate at the start of the Trump administration, I want to cover a lot of ground. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about basic climate science, talk about some of the uncertainties, ethical issues that are important when we're thinking about climate. What are climate policies? What's happened over the last eight 10, 20 years, it's important to setting up a framework for addressing climate change. And then where does Trump fit into this picture? What power does he have to change the direction of climate policy that's in place? So let's start off with the science. My guess is that most of you all have some familiarity with there being a strong scientific consensus around not just that the climate is changing, right, but that people are responsible for changing the climate. And we can go down a list of every notable scientific organization in the country, professional scientific organization, organizations like the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the American Chemical Society, the American Geophysical Union, and find statements affirming that the scientific evidence is clear, that climate change is potentially a very serious problem, that it's time to be taking urgent action. The kind of largest or uh, I guess uh, grandest synthesis of all of this research and the work of these scientists is that of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And they've stated that the warming of the climate system is unequivocal. And since the 1950s, many of the observed changes are unprecedented over decades to millennia. And the atmosphere and ocean have warmed, the amounts of snow and ice have diminished, and sea level has risen. Recent climate changes have had widespread impacts on human and natural systems, right? So there is a strong scientific consensus around climate. But why? Let's spend just a few minutes asking why is it that scientists are so confident that the climate is changing and that people are responsible? So, you know, the science behind climate change is described as robust, and it's not because they're really good models, or that it's just that there's lots of data out there. It's really connected to the ways scientists generate knowledge about the natural world, right? Scientists practice inductive reasoning, where they reason from evidence, empirical evidence that's available to them. They focus on physical properties and theories and principles and um, reason from top down using deductive reasoning. Scientists are inherently skeptical, right? They're always questioning and wondering, what else might explain this? What could be the other argument? What might be the missing piece of this puzzle, right? So they try and falsify um, to understand what may or may not be correct. And they look for patterns, what we might call consilience. So just thinking about the fact that there are lots of different ways that scientists generate knowledge, let's look at some of the evidence that's in place that helps explain why this consensus is so robust. So inductive reasoning, starting off with empirical evidence, specific observations, and generalizing based on that. We have lots of evidence available to us at this point that suggests that climate change is a significant problem. One are just the long-term records of temperature. All right, so on this graph, which starts in 1880, comes up to 2015 or 16, what we see in this red line, which is the smooth um, five-year average is an increase 
in global temperature that over the course of the 20th century was about 0.85 degrees Celsius, which is about one and a half degrees on average globally um, Fahrenheit. So, you know, one data set that we have is just the temperature record. What explains that? One of the primary drivers of changes in carbon dioxide concentrations. And we have really good measurements of carbon dioxide that have been taken since 1956 on Mauna Loa as part of a long-term study funded by NOAA. This, this is called, this is the Keeling curve for those, I mean, some of you all recognize this as the Keeling curve. But what it shows is an increase since 1960 where CO2 levels were here at 315 parts per million to today we're up to over 400 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere. This is a jump from pre-industrial levels where the CO2 level started off at 280 parts per million. So in terms of long-term records, and these are just two of many, right, we have empirical evidence that suggests that the climate is warming and that there's a relationship to carbon dioxide concentrations increasing. Anybody? know what makes 2016 special in this context, the year we just finished? The hottest on record, 2016 was the hottest year on record. It's actually the third year in a row that's been the hottest on record. And then the other thing that makes 2016 special is for the first time we spent the entire year with 400 uh, parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere. There's a seasonal wiggle in CO2 and for the first time, we didn't drop down below 400 parts per million. Keep in mind that environmental activists, people you may have heard of, like James Hansen or Bill McKibben, argue that to have a safe climate, we need to be at 350 parts per million. So down here. All right. So that's one way of reasoning one, or, and two example data sets. There's also deductive reasoning, right? Starting off with our, our understanding of how the atmosphere works, what the physical properties of greenhouse gases are. And long before anybody had global measurements of temperature or had uh, technologies to measure greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere, scientists in the mid-19th century had begun to theorize about the role that greenhouse gases play in the atmosphere and that they play a special role, molecules of carbon dioxide in absorbing and re-emitting infrared radiation. And so this theory was put into place in the mid-19th century, uh, best known by John Tyndall in 1872, and based on deductive reasoning, based on these first principles, hypothesizing that CO2 should play a role in increasing climate, right? It wasn't for another century that we actually had good data to suggest that that was actually happening. But this is an example of reasoning from first principles, deductive reasoning. That's an important part of this puzzle. Falsification. Scientists could be right The global warming is happening. Scientists could be right about a lot of things, right? But they might be misunderstanding the reasoning right, what's actually driving the change. And so one thing that scientists do is they try and falsify, right, try and find contrary evidence. They try and disprove their best theories. And this is something that cli climate scientists have been doing for decades at this point. But we also know that there is a strong, large, concerted effort to discredit climate science, right? This is a highly political issue. And, you know, per perhaps one of the kind of the strongest uh, you know, reasons to uh, put weight in the scientific consensus is how much effort has been exerted to falsify it, to disprove it, right? Skeptics have said, you know, it's probably the sun, right? It probably has something to do with sunspot, sunspot cycles, right? That might explain climate change. Or maybe it's the models. The models actually don't work. The models aren't reliable, right? We can't count on them. Or if we look back in history, you know, skeptics have said, you know, scientists have been wrong about this issue before, right? They were predicting back in the 1960s, 1970s, there wasn't climate change and global warming we should worry about. It's ice ages that we should worry about. So it's been a sustained effort to falsify this consensus. And skeptics have succeeded in finding no evidence that fundamentally changes our understanding of climate change in the scientific consensus. So one last way scientists approach this problem, which is consilience, right? Which is not too dissimilar to how you know, lawyers work, right? You look for 
independent lines of evidence. You try and assemble your best understanding based on those multiple lines of evidence, and you look for patterns in them. Right? And scientists do this as well. And I've already shown you two data sets, but there are lots of data sets right, that are out there about how our world, the biological, the geological systems are changing. And when you add all of these up and you look for the patterns, what you see is that all of the ways in which sea level and ocean acidification and ocean heat content and the surface temperatures of large lakes, they're all increasing, right, as we would expect to be consistent with a warming world. Anybody go to Lake Baikal with Marianne, Marianne Moore? Tom Hodge? No, it's a great Wellesley program. This is data that Wellesley students help collect from Lake Baikal, the largest freshwater lake in the world, which is located in Siberia. But other things that we would expect to change, see a declining pattern where Arctic flowers are flowering earlier in the year because it's warmer. We're seeing that change. And then really interesting, anybody ever participated in the Audubon Society's Christmas bird count? No? Christmas Day or around Christmas, people go out and count all the birds. And what they see, and when they assemble all this data from across the country, what they see is that they're seeing birds further and further north at wintertime than has happened historically. So their main ranges are migrating further north. And there's lots of biological evidence that's consistent with that. So all of this is evidence of consilience. So it's not just that there are models and there's, there's evidence. There's lots of different evidence. There are different theories when you put all of the pieces together, right? Scientists draw on these multiple ways of generating knowledge about the, uh, about the natural world. All of this affirms the scientific consensus that we do face a warming world and that we are driving this change. So I think for scientists, right, they approach this as a puzzle, right? They see all of these different data sets, these different theories, and they're trying to fit them together. And it's hard to fit them together. There are pieces that don't quite fit, there are pieces they're still missing, but they've got enough in place, right, that they can see the big picture, right? which is a really different way of looking at climate science from the way climate skeptics view it. I think climate skeptics look at all of these theories and all of these different pieces of evidence, and what they see is something stacked up as you know, a house of cards. And they assume, right, if they can just find that one piece of evidence that's wrong, or that one theory that doesn't quite make sense, and they pull it out, the whole stack of cards, the whole house of cards is going to come tumbling down. But this isn't how science works, right? Clim climate scientists have good reasons for raising the concerns that they brought. Um, to us as a global community. Uncertainties, right? Climate scientists know that the world's going to get warmer, that they're going to have more heat spells, that we face more extreme precipitation events, but there's a lot that we're not as certain about. So let me just talk about three uncertainties real quickly. One is this question of to what extent the variability of events is going to change. Right? Are we just going to see the mean shift where the world's going to get warmer, but the variability of events will stay the same? Or are we going to move into a world that's on average warmer, but is more variable with more frequent extreme heat events? And this is a really hard question for scientists to answer. With temperature, we're pretty certain that we're going to see more extreme heat events. But when we start talking about more specific events like hurricanes, or tornadoes, or um, droughts, it's harder to be sure how the frequency of these events is going to change. And so that's one big question climate scientists are still working on. Another is when we might see nonlinear shifts in Earth's climate system. Right, so increases in temperature, right, they're linear. They go up just a little bit every year, right? Sea level expands in the height of the seas go up just a little bit every year. But there's a chance, the way our climate system is structured, that we could see what you could describe as a nonlinear shift, right? a shift that goes from one state to another state that could be irreversible. And the best example of this are the concerns we have about the ice pack in the Arctic, right? So Greenland, Alaska, the Arctic ice pack is up here. 
Um, as you can see, this is where the ice pack has been historically. This is the lowest year on record. The ice pack only extended over this region in 2012. I know there's some climate, some students who've uh, studied climate science. Anybody want to remind us why we're so concerned about the Arctic? What makes it special? Ms. Serene? Um, is that where the ozone is severe? Well, it, that is true, although not the point. It's a good point, but not the one I was thinking of. Yeah? Um, is it potential that the amount of ice melting could change current flows? Definitely worried about the consequences of the melting ice and the ramifications of that. Polar bears? Polar bears care about this a lot. There's absolutely no question that this is the ecosystem that polar bears are dependent upon. The albedo of the ice reflects back out a lot of heat that comes in from the sun. Yeah, so what's albedo? Um, like the white um, mm -hmm. nature of the ice will reflect out more than like the oceans absorb. Yeah. So it just, if you don't have as much ice to reflect out heat, you're absorbing more. Yeah, and so to put some numbers on that, the albedo, the reflectivity of ice is about 60 to 90 percent of the radiation that comes in bounces back out to space. But when you have open water, the albedo is about 5%. So 95% of the radiation is absorbed, right? So right now, this is kind of effectively a large mirror, right? That's bouncing lots of incoming radiation back out to space. If this melts and it starts absorbing all of that radiation, right? That's like flipping a switch. And if that happens, it will dramatically change our climate overall and it will affect our, our weather on a day-to-day -day basis. So if you look at the data, this is a graph just over a year from January 1st to the end of the year in um, December. What you see is the average extent of Arctic sea ice over the course of the year. So it peaks here in, at the very end of the winter time, right? We'd expect to see a peak in March. And then right at the end of the warm season in September, it's dropped down to its minimum. So what you're seeing here is the average from 1981 to 2010. You're seeing the standard deviation, two standard deviations, accounts for 95% of the variability uh, over that period. And if you start adding on where we've been recently, what you can see for 2016 is that we were well below the average and actually really below um, two standard deviations as well. And that's not unique, right? You take the last five years and you see that we're losing more and more ice every year. And scientists were saying initially, you know, when I first started really studying climate, you know, it'd be a century before we saw the Arctic lose all of its ice. This is happening more rapidly than scientists anticipated. And as these numbers get lower and lower and continue to stay lower, they're concerns that we're approaching that tipping point, that flipping point where enough of that ice is going to melt that it can't reform and that that could happen in a matter of decades, not in a matter of centuries. So that's a really hard thing to predict, right? That's a real, you know, that's a real uncertainty that we face. One more big uncertainty, which is that the largest variable in this whole um, topic is us. It is people, right? What actions are we going to choose to take? Right, that's harder to predict than the variability or what's going to happen with the Arctic. And there are real efforts to do this. This is um, annual emissions of greenhouse gases here from 1950, projected out to 2100. And we've got data, right? We know what we did up to now, right? But this spreads out because social scientists are trying to model what would happen if we stayed with business as usual? Where would we be? Or what if we made real commitments to reducing our emissions? You know, where would that take us in terms of our emissions and the consequences of climate? But this is an enormous set of uncertainties that we're saddled with as we face this challenge. So we know a lot about climate. There's a robust scientific consensus, right? But there are real uncertainties here as well. So before we get lost in the uncertainties, just what do, what do climate scientists, when they're pinned down and asked to put some numbers on this, kind of what are the general figures that we're talking about? And based on where we're headed right now, even with our commitments in Paris to reducing greenhouse gas emissions, projections suggest we're on track for about three and a half degrees Celsius of warming in the 21st century, right? So that's on top of the 0.85 degrees Celsius warming that we saw in the 20th century. 
right? So a world where on average, you know, the temperature is going to go up 7 degrees Fahrenheit over the course of this century. And that will increase sea level, right? Somewhere in the neighborhood of half a meter, a little bit more, which is, you know, you're living by the beach and worried about big storm events. That's a big change in sea level. We know that that's going to uh, very likely, that's going to increase the number of heat waves, extreme precipitation events, and that the ocean will continue to warm and to acidify in the 21st century. So as you all move forward, I know you're going to have some really good projects that you're going to be working on, right? As part of your Albright experience, if they intersect with climate and you want kind of, a, you know, just the authoritative resource for policymakers, the best one is the one that the United Nations, um, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change puts out. Every five years, roughly, they put out their assessment of the current state of climate knowledge, and it includes a summary for policymakers. So if you're looking for a good source, go there if you want coverage that you can draw on for your projects. So the science is important. But the consequences for people and the role of people is really central to understanding climate change as well. And I think the most important framing for this is in the context of climate justice, right? Acknowledging that the people who are most at risk, not just from the consequences of climate change, but also the forces that are causing climate change are those who are people of color, who are poor, who are disadvantaged, indigenous communities living both in developed and in developing countries, right? This is a central component of um, the challenges and the importance of addressing climate change. And when I lay this out, I think, you know, most often we think of the communities of people who are on the front lines of climate change, right? The people who are living on atoll nations, right? Small island nations in the Pacific Ocean or, um, you know, smallholder farmers in Bangladesh and South Asia who are you know, exposed to sea level and um, changing precipitation patterns or you know, people living in the United States, right? Who suffered the most from Hurricane Katrina. So this is Katrina. Um, Mohammed Nasheed, the president of the Maldives to raise, draw attention to the plight of his country. He signed a um, pronouncement at an underwater cabinet meeting, right, where they're worried they're going to be um, at the end of the 21st century, since I think the maximum height of the Maldives is about two meters above sea level. Um, and then farmers in Bangladesh, right, these are people who are seeing the consequences of climate change right now. But this is also, in terms of the ethics, you know, we need to think about who's exposed to the forces that are driving uh, global warming, um, who's exposed to the consequences of fossil fuel extraction, right? And Standing Rock has been very much in the news over the last year, right? Native Americans trying to protect themselves successfully at the moment against the threat of a fossil fuel pipeline to carry energy through their lands and across their communities, across their waterways that they're not going to benefit from. There's a documentary that I've shown to my students called Crude, which is about what Chevron did to indigenous communities in Ecuador, that um, if you're looking for a weekend movie, is a really, um, it's a sad one, but a really interesting, um, important story. And then you know, the Agoni people who live in Nigeria, who have suffered the consequences of shells, um, oil extraction since the 1950s. You know, all of these folks are, um, you know, unfairly burdened with our, our fossil fuel energy system and the consequences it's going to wreak a wreck on the planet. The University of Notre Dame has a global adaptation study, which is, um, does this on a large scale. They quantitatively assess which countries are most vulnerable and least well prepared to adapt to the changes that a global, uh, the global warming will bring. And as you can see on this legend, right, red is worse, green is better. You have vulnerability here in Latin America, not surprisingly, a lot here in Sub-Saharan Africa and then in South Asia. Who's caused this problem, right? It's easy to get the data on historical greenhouse gas emissions. 
Here, the map is showing high levels of greenhouse gas emissions historically in red, low in white, and you can see that they're effectively the inverse of each other if we look at this on a national level. So you know, right at the heart of it, right, that is this issue of climate justice that demands that we address climate change as a global community. So how do we do that? So there's some structural issues that I think, just you know, thinking about you all taking on global challenges as part of the Albright Institute, you know, issues that are important to climate, but also relevant to other issues you all might be working on over the next uh, two and a half weeks. And one of these is remembering you know, problems in the commons, right? The classic parable of the tragedy of the commons, right? There are many issues, whether we're talking about, you know, especially resource issues, whether we're talking about fisheries or we're talking about forest resources, agricultural resources, or atmospheric res resources, where the tragedy of the commons applies, right? When consuming a resource is in our individual interests, right? But in doing so, we're imposing the burden of that uh, on everybody else at the expense of the common good, right? These are really hard problems to solve because nobody has an incentive to, a direct incentive to do so, right? A free rider problem arises, right? Everybody else might try and address this, but I could just benefit from their efforts to curb deforestation or better manage water resources without actually engaging the problem myself. Climate's a classic example, right? We all benefit if we're lucky enough to have fossil fuels at our disposal that we can burn and use, right? But we are imposing a cost that is distributed across the rest of the world when we do so, right? That's a classic example of the tragedy of the commons. So that's one kind of broad issue here. Another is that this is an intergenerational issue, right? Those who are going to be, you know, it's climate justice spatially amongst who's alive today, but it's a climate justice issue in terms of the costs we're imposing on the people who aren't even alive yet, right? We're making decisions about the world they're going to live in, and they're not at the table um, to discuss those with us. And there's, you know, it's hard to incentivize people, right, to take up the interests of those future generations. So this is a challenging intergenerational issue since when we, and just to put a little bit more specificity into this, when you, when, uh, when you burn gasoline in a car or in a jet, right, you're adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere that is likely to stay there for hundreds of years before it is all sequestered and brought out of the atmosphere. Right? Projections of the ways in which we're changing climate are expected to last for millennia into the future based on the best science. Right? So many future generations will be affected by the changes um, we're causing in the climate. So tragedy of the commons, intergenerational challenge, one more concept, um, which is this, that of externalities, right? Most things we buy have externalities, right? We pay a price tag for something. Uh, in this case, we can think about buying gasoline at the pump, right? We pay for the cost of extracting the gas from, uh, or the oil, from the ground for the processing, for the transportation, for the marketing, but there are lots of things we don't pay for when we buy that gasoline, right? We don't pay for the consequences for the communities that live near to the sites of extraction. Uh, we don't pay for the consequences to ecosystems and the climate either, right? Those aren't priced into the exchange, right? So it's hard to make good decisions, right? When there are externalities, things that aren't factored into the price. And fossil fuels have large externalities in terms of their social and environmental consequences. So three broad concepts to be thinking of, which have you know, very specific to climate, but also important to many other issues as well. But we have tried really hard and made a lot of important progress in addressing climate change, despite those challenges that I just listed out. And much of what, you know, the framework for global efforts to address climate change were put into place in 1992 
when the United Nations uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change was signed. Now here's something that might be a little bit surprising. This would not have happened, right? The US not only signed this, but ratified it. The US Senate ratified this in 1992 because efforts to put this policy into place were led by George H.W. Bush's administration, right, a Republican administration in the late 80s and the early 90s, and they were actually building on the Reagan administration's successful efforts to address ozone emissions. Mr. Reen brought up the ozone hole earlier. Right? One of the great success stories in international environmental policy is the global commitment to reducing uh, emissions of chlorofluorocarbons, which led to the ozone hole. So the US played a key role in the lead up to this United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And it didn't propose a solution. But what it did do is acknowledge that collectively we faced a problem. And here's kind of the key language from this whole convention. It challenged the world to stabilize greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere at a level that would prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. Right, it was that commitment, right? We read about the Paris Accord and climate negotiations right, on a regular basis right, in the newspapers. But all of that work rests on this commitment, which the global community agreed to in 1992. <laughs> and it's the culmination of a long set of meetings, what they call Conference of the Parties. Right, to figure out how to actually act on the commitments that were made in 1992. So some of these you may have heard, on, heard of. Kyoto, right, the Kyoto Protocol in 1994, kind of an initial effort to actually put limits on greenhouse gas emissions for different countries. Another one was Copenhagen. How many folks were paying attention when Copenhagen took place back in 2000? Was it 2009? Yeah. I, you know, for those who were um, focused on climate, this seemed like a real moment of potential change. But the problem with Kyoto and the problem with Copenhagen is that the U.S. commitment had really diminished. Um, for changes in our domestic politics. So even though we helped put into place the framework in, or the, um, the convention in 1992, our support for it diminished and really undermined both efforts at Kyoto and in Copenhagen. But I expect you've all heard about Paris, right? This is a celebrated moment in international efforts to address climate change. And what makes Paris different from Copenhagen and from Kyoto is that the United States, with the Obama administration's leadership, played a key role in laying the groundwork for a global commitment to addressing climate change. And the U.S. did not do this alone. U.S. leadership, as has often been the case in international environmental uh, policy, was essential, but it was not sufficient in and of itself. It was the United States partnership with China, which was forged in the, um, I, let's see, 2014, the U.S. and China announced a bilateral commitment, which really laid the groundwork for um, what became the Paris Agreement. So let's talk about the Paris Accord real quickly. Anybody remember big goals? Paris Climate Accord, you throw them out. Yeah. Curve temperature change by two degrees. Yeah. Well, so that's actually an outcome that became the goal. Anybody remember what they were hoping would be the goal? Yeah. No. Definitely limit carbon emissions. Um, and I think one important thing is limit carbon emissions, and this is a big change from previous efforts, not just from developed countries like the European Union and the United States and Japan, but developing countries as well, right? And that's what that alliance of the U.S. and China made possible. They were hoping that preventing dangerous interference, right, that's what that 1992 charge was, that that would be 1.5 degrees Celsius, so limiting carbon emissions to keep temperature rise below 1.5 degrees Celsius. 
that it would, um, you know, on the table for the first time, include commitments by both developed and developing countries. Whoop, developed and developing. Um, and then also a process by which to do this, um, a systematic process. The outcome of Paris was that they ideally would like to see the world at 1.5 degrees Celsius warming. More practically, they set the target at 2 degrees Celsius warming. They did get commitments, right? They got 197 countries to commit, both developed and developing countries, to targets for the first time for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Prior to this, right at Kyoto, it was only the developed countries that made a commitment, and that was a real challenge for moving this um, climate negotiations forward. And the other outcomes were what they call a pledge and review approach, where countries have a lot of flexibility. And this is one of the reasons Paris succeeded, right? They didn't say, we're going to tell each state how it should tackle this problem. It said, we want you to take the goals that you've agreed upon and figure out how best to implement them such that they work for your country's economic situation, social situation, the issues that are specific to your country. It is not a binding agreement, but it is an aggressive agreement with systematic periodic reviews that will ensure that there's a lot of attention uh, to the extent to which countries are meeting their goals. But even based on the initial commitments, we're not on track for two degrees Celsius. The initial commitments put us on track for holding warming to three and a half degrees Celsius. So considering the challenges in addressing climate, though, this was considered, and rightfully, a milestone in international uh, commitments to addressing climate change. So that happened in December of 2015. And really, you know, looking at the Obama administration and what the Obama administration has achieved over the last eight years, one of the signal accomplishments, uh, domestic legacies, international legacies of the Obama administration will be its energy policy and its efforts to address climate change. This will be up there along with the efforts to address healthcare and immigration as significant um, you know, pieces of the Obama administration's work. Trump and the incoming Trump administration in the 115th Congress, like so much of Obama's legacy, puts this very much in question. So what I want to do is spend the rest of my talk talking, or explaining what's at stake, what could happen, what might not happen, because as you might guess, these um, issues are uh, they're, they're complex. So let's start off, though, by trying to get our heads around what the Obama administration has put us in place to do. So here are greenhouse gas emissions and CO2 equivalents from 2000 out to 2025. So we've got data, right? We know what we've done here um, over the last 15 years. Interesting pattern, right? Notice there's a dip there in the middle. Why would there be a dip? What could be going on? Right, greenhouse gas emissions are always supposed to go up, aren't they? But the pattern isn't quite like that. Any ideas why? Increase in the price of gas, so less driving. Yeah, there's a big increase in the price of gas around here. Yep, in the you know, 2005, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, yeah. Was it around like the, maybe the 2008 recession, so it was overall just like less productivity? Yeah, so that's another kind of macroeconomic factor that was at play, right? We see a real sharp drop here after the Great Recession in 2008, 2009, and energy prices were higher, which certainly drives behavior. And overall, you can see a slight downward trend with a real sharp drop around the Great Recession. So this is kind of historically where we've been over the last um, 15, 16 years with greenhouse gas emissions in the United States. But projections going out into the future suggest that business as usual for the United States should be an increase of about 3% uh, in greenhouse gas emissions every year if we don't 
uh, don't implement policy uh, to move us in a different direction. The Obama administration, and this was the first time the United States had made a commitment to addressing greenhouse gas emissions. In Paris, committed us to reducing our greenhouse gas emissions by 26 to 28 percent by 2025. Right? This is a major commitment, right? That will change, would change the cars we drive, how we heat and cool our houses, uh, how we generate power in this country. It will also make our environment safer. It will protect vulnerable communities. But we're talking about very significant changes and, of course, changes in our economy as well. So let's zoom in here just on these last couple of years. And I just want to give you some sense for how the Obama administration um, justified this commitment or kind of laid out a plan of action to um, follow through on this commitment that was made in Paris. So one piece of this is called the Clean Power Plan, which is focused on how we generate electricity in this country. A second one is a whole sweep of efficiency measures. Um, and this pertains to everything from how we extract oil and gas um, from land to uh, the light bulbs we put that we go and buy at Home Depot or Lowe's or wherever, uh, to appliances, to cars. And so just for the purposes today of not going through everything from light bulbs to washers and dryers, I'm just going to focus on the cars. Okay? So these federal efficiency standards get us another major chunk of reductions. There have been other actions that have been taken at the state and local level. They're an important piece of this puzzle. And you know, based on all of this, you know, the US was kind of can go a long ways towards meeting its commitments in Paris. But there is a chunk that's just other. We're not entirely sure. We're going to need some new policies, some things we have not yet thought of to get us all the way to that 26 to 28 percent reduction. Um, these are estimates. These are not exact calculations, uh, a disclaimer there. But I wanted to illustrate kind of this pie-shaped approach. Right? There are a bunch of wedges that are important to how the Obama administration made sense of how we could accomplish the goals we were setting out for ourselves. So let's scoot that over and let's talk about these. Let's start with the Paris Climate Accord. So what happened? All right. So a lot of folks have heard about the Paris Climate Accord. I've just told you a little bit about it. Now, one thing that did not happen was that it was not ratified by the US Senate. Right? Congress did not approve this. Right? President Obama signed this commitment based on the guidance of his administration and his policies. Right? He did not consult with Congress in any, um, or at least ask them to actually sign off on this. So the question should arise, why? How could he do this? How could he commit us to such a uh, significant um, program? And, the reason is because of that United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change that the U.S. Senate did ratify in 1992. Because we ratified that, and it committed us to trying to ensure that we um, keep, avoid dangerous anthropogenic interference in the climate system, he could sign that Paris Accord uh, based on his commitment as he did in August of 2016, right? So he just signed this. Now, everybody expected that it would take a year or so for all of the countries needed to actually sign on to the accord, to actually put it into force. There are a couple of steps to put this into action. And the first one is that you've got to get as many of the 197 parties as possible to sign. So it went into force when 55 parties signed. And that happened much more quickly than anybody anticipated. So it was, went into force on October 5th. And as of today, 121 countries around the world have actually committed to the accord, which means it is now in place. 
which is important because it makes, once it goes into force, countries can't simply withdraw from it. So that raises the question of what are Trump's options? So one option is that he can simply withdraw from the Paris Agreement. And he can do this, but it will take him a long time to do so. The language of the Paris Accord states that parties can withdraw after three years. And at that point, they have to wait a year before they actually do so. So you signal your intent at three years, and you can pull out in the fourth year. So that's one option. If Trump is patient, right, he could pull out after four years. Another option is that the US could do something much more drastic. It could actually go back to that 1992 agreement and pull out of that, right? Which would take the United States entirely out of the international community's efforts to address climate change. We wouldn't be at any of the meetings at that point. We wouldn't be party to any of the talks. But the Paris Agreement says if you pull out of the United Nations, or the Framework Convention on Climate, Year, um, climate Convention on Climate Change, then that nullifies your commitment to the Paris Climate Accord. So that would be option two, and really the m much more troubling, because it only requires one year of notice to do so. So the third option would be to simply ignore the accord. It doesn't have any um, teeth. There are no um, penalties or fines that are going to be put into place. He could simply just ignore it and not put any emphasis on it and um, kind of undercut it in that manner. So those are the options that Trump faces. And really, of all the things we should be watching as the Trump administration begins to get its bearings and put um, policy into place, if they pursue option two here, that would be a drastic shift in the US's commitment, not just to climate change, but uh, the world community as a whole, since so many parties are committed to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. All right, so if you care about climate, this is a big one to be worried about. So this federal clean power plan, what's at stake here? A lot. So the Environmental Protection Agency finalized this clean power plan about a year and a half ago, August 3rd, 2015. And what the clean power plan does is it responds to a Supreme Court decision in 2005 called Massachusetts versus EPA because Massachusetts was one of the lead plaintiffs that said the EPA is not doing its job with respect to the Clean Air Act because it's not regulating carbon dioxide. And the Supreme Court said, we agree, and that needs to take place. So the Supreme Court charged um, the EPA with doing so, and that set in motion what's called a rulemaking process, right? Congress passes laws, but they delegate responsibility for implementing those laws to the agencies. Right? And so that's what the EPA did. And over the course of two years, it developed this clean power plan to require utilities, electrical utilities, to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. They do it on a state-by-state -state basis. The goal is to achieve a 30% reduction in emissions from the power sector by 2030. Right? This is a big deal right? if you work in the electrical uh, utility industry. In fact, this makes it very hard to continue using coal. And so when you hear about Obama's war on coal, this is what they're talking about. They're talking about this clean power plan. And one thing I want to emphasize is this two-year process to make a rule requires you do a lot of things if you work at the Environmental Protection Agency. You have to hold public hearings. You have to consult with affected stakeholders like the industries, right? You have to go out and get good science to back up. You have to understand what the state of the science is to justify why you chose 30% instead of 15% or 45%. This is a long process. It's very much open to the public. There are many opportunities for public comment in the process of developing rules to implement laws. Okay, this is important 
because when we think about what Trump's options are, he can't come in and just wave a magic wand and say, we're done with that. We're not doing that. He doesn't have power. For all the power of the presidency, you can't simply wave a wand and make rules that you don't like go away. These rules have the force of law, and they must be legal. They have to be legal based on existing statute, right? So they have to be in compliance with that Supreme Court decision and what the Clean Air Act says. So what are Trump's options? One is that there are debates, right? There are disputes, there's litigation about whether the Clean Power Plan is legal in the first place. And it's very likely that this is going to wind up before the Supreme Court um, sometime in the next couple of months. So one option that Trump has is he could just not defend the Clean Power Plan in court. Right? He could let the states like Oklahoma and the fossil fuel industries mount a strong, aggressive challenge, and, um, and that might result in the rule being rejected. There's only one problem. Remember the Supreme Court back here said, you have to come up with a rule to implement CO2 regulations under the Clean Air Act. So if this one's deemed illegal, then Trump has to come up with a new one. So that's option two. The Trump administration could develop a new rule to address greenhouse gas emissions from the utility industry. But here's the thing. If you issue a new rule, you have to go through all the steps that the Obama administration has already gone through. Right now, if you're appointing Scott Pruitt as the director, the administrator of the EPA, you're going to wind up somewhere very different right, in terms of your regulations at the end of that process. But you still have to go through the process. Right? So it's going to take several years if Trump wants to implement a new rule of public hearings, in theory, consultations with scientists, and examining the consequences of the rule. So that would be option two, issue a new rule. The third, and this is where if you care about climate, you might want to start getting really nervous. Trump's coming into office with a Republican-controlled 115th Congress. Right? Congress is the one that passed the Clean Air Act initially, way back in 1970. Congress could take action to adopt legislation that amends the Clean Air Act and excludes climate change and greenhouse gas emissions from its scope. If that were to happen, it would entirely undercut the ability of the Environmental Protection Agency to take action on climate. Any guesses as to what might happen if Trump and the, hundred, and the Republicans tried to do this in Congress? What could be the hurdles there? Yeah. And what's a filibuster? It's when one group, group um, refuses to leave the floor, basically, so they physically block movement forward. Yeah, and if you can't move forward, then you can't vote, right? So Democrats could and hopefully will filibuster any substantial legislation that would fundamentally change a law like the Clean Air Act. So. It's possible that the Republicans might change the rules and eliminate the filibuster, which would have you know, significant implications for all legislative activity in Congress, especially environmental laws. But that would be the third option, would be to change the law itself, right? which would mean that you didn't have to go through this rulemaking process at all. So we will see. All right. Cars, I promised I would talk about cars. So the federal efficiency standards, right? There are lots and lots of them. But one thing that you might have heard of is that the EPA suddenly put a huge rush on its efforts to finalize the rules for how efficient the cars automakers make have to be. So we have standards, right? And you guys go and see that sticker in the side of the uh, car window where it tells you how efficient the car is going to be. Right? So the Energy Policy Act of 1975 and then some amendments to the Clean Air Act require the government to set fuel efficiency standards. And these have crept up slowly over time. 
But in 2012, in the aftermath of the economic crisis, right, the recession, when the auto industry was on, um, was in, uh, about to crash, Obama negotiated for a significant reduction, in, or I'm sorry, a significant, significant increase in fuel efficiency standards. And the proposal will double the fuel efficiency of U.S. vehicles. It sets a target of 54.5 miles per gallon in 2025, up from 25 miles per gallon right now, right? So if you do that, right, you're taking a lot of carbon out of the system and having much more efficient vehicles in the process. So this is, you know, automakers are very concerned about this, and there's a lot of effort to reverse these. And the reason I wanted to highlight the fuel efficiency standards for cars is because, one, this is something that's called a midnight rule. The Obama administration's rushing through this final rule right now in the lame duck session after Trump has been elected to try and consolidate its um, climate legacy. And Trump has an option to put all of these last minute rules on hold. And because this one's happening in the last 90 days prior to his inauguration, this is one that he could put on hold immediately. He actually has the power to do this. Um, if he did, he would then have to do the same thing as the Clean Air Act. He'd have to go through that long process of coming up with a new set of rules to replace it. So he can't wave the magic wand. He's got to go through the process. But he can do that a little bit more easily in the case of the fuel efficiency standards than he can the clean power plan. All right, so these are all ways in which Trump has a lot of power. But I do want to mention some ways in which Trump doesn't have as much power and just highlight how important state level policy is because this is going to be an area where we see a lot more um, work on climate in this country in the next four years. And two states that stand out in terms of addressing greenhouse gas emissions and their plans are California and Massachusetts, which have uh, committed to reducing state level greenhouse gas emissions by up to 25 percent below 1990 levels by 2020. States like California and Massachusetts have also said, we want more clean energy, right? In fact, we're going to require utilities in Massachusetts and California to have more clean energy on the grid. So California requires by 2020 that 30, 30, and 33 percent of energy be from renewable resources, and Massachusetts requires 20 percent of energy come from renewable resources by 2020. And so what does this actually mean? I'm borrowing this really nice chart from Kieran, who wrote about this topic for her Calderwood seminar this past fall. And this top line shows what we've already looked at, which is U.S. overall emissions over the last 15 years. But what I want to highlight is that California, because of its state level commitments, has seen a significant drop uh, below 1990 levels, and they're targeting to be about 7% below 1990 levels by 2020. And it seems like they're you know, reasonably on target to do so. Massachusetts is a national leader in energy efficiency and renewable energy. And as you can see, we're already well below 1990 levels, and we're on track to meet that goal of being 25% below, which suggests, right, if you have good policies, um, and <coughs> states like California and Massachusetts do, that can make a real difference. There's other local policy. Amanda mentioned our sustainability plan here at the college. We've committed to reducing our emissions. We have a power plant here on campus by 37% by 2026. So all of this adds up to those state and local commitments that are important to addressing climate change. Trump has few options in terms of constraining these commitments. And there are a lot of these commitments. Two-thirds of states have renewable portfolio standards where they're requiring more clean energy. 650 institutions of higher education have committed to climate reductions. So that's the big puzzle. But as you can see, many pieces of this are vulnerable, especially this commitment in Paris. Do policies matter anyways? Maybe this doesn't matter, right? And there are actually just two counter arguments I want to throw out there for you before we finish. One counter argument is that if you actually look at what's happened in terms of emissions 
it doesn't seem like climate policy really ch moves the needle that much, right? So if you analyze emissions before and after, it suggests they have little impact. Right here are the countries that committed back to the Kyoto Protocol in 1994. And what you see is that emissions were on a downward trajectory before 1994, and that downward trajectory continues after 1994. So what's the difference? If you look at uh, the European trading system that was put into place in 2002, you know, it seems like the story is the same. There was a downward trajectory beforehand, and it simply continued after the policy came into force. So why? So the folks who wrote the study, Nordhaus, um, argue that it's not the policy that matters. What really is driving energy and uh, efficiency are large-scale economic and technological factors that are driving out coal, increasing natural gas, and the amount of renewable energy in, this, in the world. And you know, they've got an important point, right? And if you look at just energy use in the United States, just want to highlight that We've all heard about fracking, right? Fracking for natural gas and oil. That has driven here from 2010 to 2015 an enormous jump in the amount of natural gas. That's, there we go, natural gas that's being used in the United States. And coal has fallen significantly because of that. Not so much because of policy, but because of the macroeconomics and the technology of producing natural gas. So natural gas is on the rise for reasons independent of policy. If you look at wind power, this column shows the price of wind power, and you can see that it has dropped precipitously over the last 30 years. And as the price has fallen, the amount that's being deployed is rising significantly. The story is the same with solar. The price of solar has dropped incredibly sharply, and the deployment has risen. These are large-scale changes that are affected by policy, but are also being driven forward for economic and technological reasons. And there's no reason to suggest that changes in international policy will change the underlying um, the fundamentals that are driving these shifts in the energy industry. So that's one counter argument. The other one is that it's not so much policy, it's really what people do. Right? You can't do it from the top down. And so there's a really interesting book uh, if you want to get into this more, called Climate Shock. And it argues for something, um, um, they argue that you know, idealism is really important, um, and that it can accomplish what international conferences have not, solving the seemingly intractable, intractable problem of global warming. The example they give is Copenhagen, where over half of the people bike to work in Copenhagen. Now, why? Right? It's not because the Danes made a law that said everybody has to bike to work. Right? They argue that it's about a cultural shift, about peer pressure, about a social commitment to change that then enabled the Copenhagen to make this transition in its energy infrastructure. So they call this the Copenhagen theory of change, and it really highlights the importance of that bottom-up transition, which then supports policy change. But they argue that idealism, this commitment, this individual work is uh, important and can play a role um, that international policy agreements like Paris cannot. So those are two important counterarguments to focus on, which are really you know, things that might suggest we've got other tools than those that um, than the things that the Trump administration can pull the levers on. All right, so just to finish off, three closing points here about what is at risk. One, we should be worried about the Paris Climate Accord. If Trump wants to, he could change that, um, pull the United States out of it by pulling us out of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, and we should be concerned about what the international repercussions of that could be, right? That would be viewed um, very sharply by the international community. So that's one big concern here. As far as domestic policy goes, yes, Trump can make change, but he can't wave the wand, right? It is change that will take time, it has to go through process, and it has to be legal, right? It has to be in accord with our existing statutes. So his powers are more limited, but if Congress plays along, if they can roll the Democrats, then we could see significant uh, reform. 
And then the th third point, and one that I really have not focused on, but I just want to throw out there, is that, you know, as I said at the very beginning, this is not the first time we have seen Republicans come in with promises of large-scale change. But it turns out that anti-environmental um, policy does not work as well as it does, you know, as a political uh, talking point. So most of these previous efforts really have failed to make large-scale change. But I think we also know that this isn't like previous moments in American history. So I'll stop there. Thanks for your attention.